Hello everyone and welcome to BrickCats. My channel is for anyone who enjoys custom LEGO creations, likes saving money, and or those looking to get into custom building. If you're a fan of my channel or are interested in supporting what I do, please consider subscribing, liking this video, or leaving a comment. Each subscription, like, and comment helps others find my channel and I greatly appreciate it. Today I am reviewing the Aggressive Reconnaissance 170 or the ARC 170 Starfighter designed by Thomas Jenkins and distributed by Brick Vault. If you're interested in building this or any other Brick Vault model, you can take 15% off the cost of your order by using my discount code, CATS15. I do receive a small amount of compensation when you use my code, and this is an amazing way to support my channel while taking a bite out of the price of the instructions. There are two mandatory substitutions that I will take into account with the original price here. I'll cover those in the parts section, but I was getting four stores and $226 without shipping and tax, or about $270 with shipping and tax. And I did use a $7 shipping average just because the quantity of pieces you're buying from these sellers would be pretty high. In my reviews, I offer my opinions on aesthetics and model features, parts issues you might want to look out for, the build experience, the model's integrity, and I close out with my overall impression and pricing information in the conclusion. If you're watching this review, I assume you've bought the instructions or are interested in buying them. I also assume a basic level of familiarity with BrickLink's ordering system and LEGO nomenclature. I only use genuine LEGO bricks and I always purchase the instructions. Finally, I create these reviews for my own personal enjoyment and the hopes that my advice will make your experience more enjoyable and or less expensive. The ARC 170, as you can probably tell, is a pretty big model. It measures about 20 and a quarter inches wide, 15 and a quarter inches from the front to the tip of the back cannon, and it sits about 8.5 inches off the surface of my table here when on the stand. The model does include landing gear, I'll show you it later, and the model sits about 5.5 inches off the display surface on the landing gear. Starting at the nose, I really love the shaping here. These long slopes on the top of the fuselage are matched nearly perfectly on the sides using the older fingered style hinges, and you can kind of see the angle right here, but this is actually a very smooth transition. These meet up very nicely right at the front here, with a 6x3 wedge angling downwards underneath. This dark bluish gray bracket right here is a little unfortunate. Uh, this model debuted in 2019, but the dark red recolor for the bracket 1x2, 1x2 inverted was not available at the time. It came out in 2022, so that's perfectly excusable. And the dark green stripe uses the tile that came with the official ARC-170 set to create that rounded pattern with the dark green there. The pilot's cockpit has some controls and a screen there, and it sits in minifigure just fine. The construction of the fuselage matches up very nicely with the cockpit in this rear area here. And if I take this guy out, you can see he's just got like a little seat in there. Doesn't stud in, but doesn't really need to. And while I'm in the cockpit area, I do want to take some time to point out that I think the engine intakes are maybe just a little bit too far from the center line. The cannon material I can see it has these looking a little closer, but all told, I think it's fine to keep the axis of the engines constant at the expense of moving them out a bit. Uh, by that, I mean, of course, uh, you want the engine to be a straight through kind of deal. Moving to the forward gunner position, I think this is my least favorite part of the ship as far as appearances go because it uses the same windscreen as the cockpit. This section lifts up to reveal the gunner's area. Apparently you can fit a minifigure in here without disassembling it. I had to disassemble a lot of this to get this guy in here. I'm not really sure what I was doing wrong, but if you build this you'll see that it is, it is a little tight. And so there's no, certainly no shame in if removing some pieces to get the figure in and then rebuilding it. In Kamen, the forward gunner's cockpit is much smaller and with a much more limited field of view than the pilot's cockpit. So this front area should be all solid white, and I think that would necessitate a different building technique and a different windscreen to improve the accuracy here. However, I do love the inclusion of these little side windows here and this wedge piece to create the angled look. And then, believe it or not, the connection point in the middle here does serve a purpose, and that is actually reflected in the cannon material as well. The astromech sits in between the front and the rear gunner, and is essentially built into the ship. It's not the easiest thing to remove or put back in, but it is possible to do after the fact. To me, the droid sits a little high, so you can certainly be forgiven if you just want to use the head and maybe a little uh, brick-built construction inside to move it down a plate or two. The construction around the droid is excellent though. 
but it's a nice snug fit with enough play such that you can move these little side pieces around just enough to uh, get it in or out without too much difficulty. The rear gunner's position is another area that could use a different windscreen, as this one is even stubbier than the forward gunner's. A minifigure sits in this space, with lots of room to spare, and there are some rudimentary controls. But in this area, there are some gaps in the floor. Just kind of see my hand down there, and there is a gap. Um, you can see some of the dark red highlights. There's my finger. Um, but this isn't too big of a deal. The two rear cannons are built very nicely. They only move in one direction, and that's kind of up and down. Personally, I don't find myself wanting to rotate, rotate these around too much. Um, it would not be very difficult to modify this to get that functionality. If you wanted to, you'd probably use a tow ball connection. The sides of the main fuselage are very simply built, and all of these lines and the angles come together very nicely at the back here. The engines are greeveled very effectively with a variety of system and technic elements. They terminate in this cone in the rear with some trans pink engine glow. And I showed them earlier, but the main engine intakes to either side have the angled divider, and the subassemblies that surround it do a fairly good job representing a large cylinder. All of the gaps in the engine are covered up fairly well with these modified plates with rail pieces. The S foils are built into the wings, and there's no mechanism to extend them, you can position them manually. In canon, the S-foils are designed to provide additional cooling rather than to deploy weapon systems into an attack configuration like in the X-Wing. And the designer has represented the cooling fins with a with some light bluish gray coloring underneath the S-foils on the main wing, which is a nice touch. You can see it right here. The Republic insignia tile is right on top here in more or less the right place. And the S-foils do have a decent range of motion, and then they are held in place just with friction in this back connection right here. The rotation point is a Technic hole on a solid stud, and this generally allows the S-foils to stay in place. I have had to tighten this section up a little bit to give it the stick, and the S-foils are capable of extending pretty far up, and probably farther than I think they should go, um, to be completely accurate, but you know, the solution obviously is to just not do that. So right about here is perfect, and if you need to tighten it up, you just kind of press back like that. Same on all four um, S-foils. The main wings are nicely shaped, and the outer two-thirds of the wing are all brick-built, from the tip here to right here. This is one of the main Technic lift arms that support the wing. I have noticed some minor drooping on the main wings, but it's pretty subtle, and it's also very easy to straighten out. You'll notice some red-brown right here, reddish-brown. Those are uh, one by one bricks with holes, and that's because the dark red version of that piece wasn't released until January 2020 with the Harley Davidson model. One really nice touch, I love how this arch brick uh, hides part of a one by two tile to round out the end of the light bluish gray section, as well as this little vent right near the engine intake. Under each wing, the massive laser cannons look appropriately beefy, and while I think it's a bit too large for the scale, I really like the use of the slope piece on the end here. Again, in 2019, the element inventory isn't what it is today, and you could probably refine this a little bit with maybe some minifigure candles uh, on the barrel here to get kind of that tapering effect, but all in all, I think the cannons are very well done. The model does include landing gear concealed very well in the nose right here, as well as the back with these fingered hinges here. They fold up and down very easily, and the model is very stable on the landing gear as well. Finally, there is an included stand which holds the fighter at a nice height and a slight upward tilt. The stand's connection point is a little odd to me as there's no actual guidance in the instructions showing which studs it's supposed to connect to. I did some trial and error, and the best spot seems to be between the two forward studs of these grey wedge pieces on the bottom here. right here. But this isn't great because these wedge pieces aren't held in particularly well. You can kind of see these is, this is wiggly. The stand in the instructions is also different than the ones shown in the official 2019 intro video. And I found that if you try and use these four studs back here, the model is actually very front heavy and I found it very easy to knock it or have it tip over. Either way, the stand does look very good and supports what's otherwise a fairly heavy model if you connect it in the right place. So I find myself, again, using these two studs here 
on these two anti studs there. It definitely is a little awkward to, well, it seems like it will be awkward to do this, but if you use those two studs, it's very stable. Thomas Jenkins Arc 170 and the stand requires 319 elements and 1,657 pieces. The stand does have a separate parts list, but I combined them for this review because I do think the stand is necessary. I mentioned two mandatory substitutions in the introduction. The first is changing the 3L pins without friction ridges originally specified in blue to tan. The pin without friction ridges does not come in blue, however the pin with friction ridges part 6558 is very common and will work just as well here. These go on in step 71 are and are used in the construction of the rear of the ship. The second mandatory substitution is due to an impending Bricklink catalog deletion, and that's for the tile round 2x2 with dark red Star Wars semicircles on transparent background pattern sticker, part 4150PB168. You can substitute the printed tile, which looks better anyway, part 4150PX33. Part 4150PB167 is also a stickered version and an acceptable substitute, but the printed version is much more common anyway. The astromech droid specified is R2-D2, and it's still broken up into the individual parts. You probably already have an R2-D2, so you can safely eliminate the following elements or swap in the complete minifigure. That's minifigure SW0028. Obviously, as you can see, you can use any astromech that you want. R2-D2, I don't think he ever appears in an Arc-170 in the Clone Wars, but whatever droid you have will be fine. The lone 2x4 tile in dark green, part 87079, is very expensive on Bricklink right now. However, this element just returned to Pick a Brick in November of 2023. If you don't want to buy it from Pick a Brick, you can substitute two 1x4 tiles in dark green, part 2431. These go right in front of the pilot's windscreen right here. The wedge 4x2 sloped left, part 43721, and the wedge 4x2 sloped right, part 43720, in dark red are extremely rare and only came in the Maris container line ships. These help shape the underside of the fighter right down under the wing here. This will be difficult to see, but I'll try and show. Uh, what's the best angle to see? All right, so you kind of see how there are slopes here and then it curves in towards the fuselage in a nice smooth way. Those are the angled wedge pieces. I would switch these out for the standard four by two Wedge, part 41767 and 41768. They look as obviously not quite as clean as the slope slides won't match, but it's the only piece that fits this profile, and as you saw with my difficulty trying to show you all where it was, it doesn't really show up much anyway. The four sets of fingered hinge plates, part 4276 specified in white and 4275 specified in black, are nearly completely hidden and in my opinion can be any color, but any neutral will certainly work. Two of them create the angled section at the bottom of the ship, which, again, quite difficult to see, but we are talking about down here, while the other two form the shallow angle in the nose here. The two cylinder 3x6x2 three by by and 2 thirds horizontal square connections between interior studs, part 93168, can be substituted with the older variant. The cylinder 3x6x2 three by by and 2 thirds horizontal round connections between interior studs, part 30360. The newer variant is less common and can occasionally be quite expensive. I don't have one of them to test, but I found that the rearmost section of the engines didn't fit great in line with the older variant. And this may be because the bar that holds the subassembly isn't braced in like it is in the newer variant with the kind of cross um, cross studs there, I guess. I solved this by adding two tile round 2x2 two two with open stud, part 18674, in any neutral color in place of the two plate round 2x2 two two with axle hole, part 4032, specified in dark bluish gray. This gives the bar some more stability. In the Brick Vault video, they presumably used the specified variant of the cylinder and still commented that this section was a little loose. So this might be a good change no matter which one you go with. In step 92, you add a 1x2 hinge brick, part 3937 in light bluish gray, a 2x2 hinge plate, part 6134 in light bluish gray, and a tile modified 2x2 with studs on edge in black, part 33909. 
This forms the angled part of the forward gunner seat, but I was not able to figure out how to get a figure to sit in here nicely without removing pieces. These are certainly not structural and you can't see them anyway, so I would just omit them entirely, and that's what allows that's what allowed me to get the gunner to sit in there without major disassembly. The two minifigure utensil toolbox wrench, six rib handle, part 6246D in black are used as the pilot's control sticks. I recommend changing these to the bar 1L with 1x1 round plate with hollow stud, part 32828 in black. The wrench piece isn't uncommon, but the bar 1L piece is very common, and this usually cuts down on a store, and certainly is cheaper. This increases the quantity of the bar 1L in black from 1 to 3. The Technic Gear 8 Tooth Part 3647 in light bluish gray works just as well in the old light gray in my opinion, so check the price on this to see if it makes sense to substitute it, and that's a little detail right on the end of the cannon right here. For the stand, the only substitution worth considering is changing the 4 Technic Pin 3L with friction ridges Part 6558 specified in black to the more common blue. Obviously you can see them down here, uh, so if that's going to bother you I certainly would not change them. But it doesn't bother me, um, so I changed those out. The blue ones are much more common than the black and are therefore less expensive. Even though this model has almost 300 elements, the quantities aren't that large for anything too uncommon on BrickLink, so there's really not a subset of elements that gives you an outsized savings using Pick a Brick. I did price it out, buying as much as possible from Pick a Brick, and the results will be in the conclusion. Instructions for the ARC-170 consists of 333 steps, with each part or subassembly you add in each step outlined in red against the white background. The red outline is fairly thin in my opinion, and can be hard to see occasionally, but generally it's not too bad. This was a fairly early Brick Vault model. As far as I can tell, the web store opened up in late 2017, and new models were not coming out as frequently back then. The ARC-170 video came out on March 29th, 2019. Having built several of the early Brick Vault models at this point, as well as their revisions, I am comfortable saying that Brick Vault's quality control has gotten a lot better as they released more and more models. Of course, the fact that quality control has gotten better means they had to start somewhere, and the long story short on the Arc 170's build experience is that I found these instructions to be somewhat difficult to follow, and it really took away from the building experience. But before I get into some of the issues, I'll offer some good news, and that is the designer of this model has revised it at least once at this point, as shown on his Instagram. So it may be the case that at some time in the near future, we'll get an update for this model. I think the easiest way to do this is to go through my major categories of problems with instructions. So first up are viewing angle issues. There are a very large number of steps in which the pieces, or a piece in step, are hidden from view. Most of the time you can make an educated guess at where they go, but you really should not have to do this. In other cases, it's impossible to distinguish between, for example, a 1x1 brick and a 1x1 brick modified with stud on the side. Occasionally, you are forced to figure this out for yourself, such as in step 164 because the pieces don't fit any other way, as long as you assume that the brick with the stud on the side goes into one of the Technic holes in the lift arm. However, other steps, such as 285, it's much less clear what the orientation of the modified brick is supposed to be, since the step is displayed at an odd angle, and you can't see if the two 1x1 plates on the far side have studs or anti-studs showing. Finally, for viewing angles, showing the connection points for large sub-assemblies is usually very helpful. I only ran into this once, and again, it's one of those things you can figure out for yourself. Uh, that's the alignment of the large side sub-assemblies right here, that go on in steps 205 and 215. Basically, just make sure the rear lines up properly, and you probably got it but a photo or highlighting which studs it connects to would be very welcome. Next up are floating pieces, and there are a number of instances in which floating pieces or, sub, uh, or floating sub-assemblies can be a handful. And floating pieces are those that are shown in the step that aren't actually connected to anything for a number of steps moving forward in the instructions. Building the droid socket is a good example of this around steps 107 and 108, and it's quite difficult to do without the droid providing a little backstop in the sub-assembly. Another example is in step 125, where four brackets are shown but aren't actually connected. Steps 125 and 126 should probably be combined into a subassembly, as they don't connect to the main model until step 127. A last big example of this are the wings, starting in steps 273 and 279. It's definitely super annoying to lay out all these pieces and then start putting tiles on top of them, especially since there are modified plates that aren't lying flat. The last major category I usually find are called sequencing errors. These are steps that would be better in a different order or at a different point in the build. 
Steps 36 to 38 would be better built as a subassembly and then connected to the main body at the end, because otherwise you're connecting that 1x2 bracket in two different directions at once. In step 147, you can't get the subassembly in place without removing the 2x2 modified plate with stud that went on in step 69. The instructions for the other side don't have this problem since it's in a more logical order for some reason. The pieces that go on in steps 163 and 188 should be connected earlier in the build. It's quite difficult to get that 1x1 brick with studs on sides opposite in place between the two lift arms at this stage. The logical place is immediately following step 153 for the port side and 180 for the starboard side. The last major sequencing problem I have was the front landing gear, which is the penultimate step number 332. Until you put the landing gear on in this step, the sides of the front fuselage right here are very fragile. And this really should go on when you're constructing the nose section immediately following step 58. At the end of the build, you're trying to snap hinge bricks onto hinge plates which require a lot of force, while trying to prevent the rest of the model from falling or losing control of it. Furthermore, it's not even possible to get the hinge bricks to snap in as pictured because the fingered hinge plates are in the way, so you have to deconstruct the sides of the nose and then kind of jimmy them back into place after both sides are rebuilt around the hinge bricks. Now onto the rest of the issues I found which don't fit nicely into the three major categories. Steps 291 and 296 show the subassemblies that make out the main engine's intake shape. They could use multipliers of X3 and X2 respectively. Attaching the wings is not shown at all in the instructions, a curious omission for sure after step 284. In step 216, there are two bricks shown as slightly misaligned, but they are flush with each other in real life. Curiously, the misalignment persists through the wing section, but it isn't shown in the mirror image in step 232, and I assume this is just a studio artifact. For both the main part of the wings and the engines, the instructions say to repeat the previous steps to make the opposite side. This is not a straight repetition though, as the two sides are mirror images of each other instead of identical copies. While the wings are fairly simple, all you have to do is reverse the 1x2 tile. The engines are not simple at all because of the geometry of the build. Dedicated steps for at least the other engines should have been included for sure, and I find this even more curious because the cannons have the same mirror symmetry but are depicted separately in the instructions. Step 155 includes this little filler subassembly toward the back of the engine on the port side, However, the analogous step for the starboard side, step 181, does not include them. I didn't have any of those pieces left over, so I don't think these made it into the parts list either. And if you noticed the gap earlier on mine, so here it is filled in. On the other side, I left this open just to remind myself that that wasn't there. Step 279 shows one plate modified one by one with clip, which is then duplicated for the other wing. This implies you need two of them, but the parts list only calls for one. In step 32, a dark bluish gray 2L lift arm is shown, but it's light bluish gray in the parts list. In step 290, there is a 2x2 plate shown in a very odd place. This should be part of step 294, but it's very clearly missing from that step. Either I am missing something major, or this is a mistake. As far as I can tell, there's no reason the 2x2 plate needs to go on in step 290, and it doesn't in fact connect to anything in step 290, so it's just floating there. The last step has you putting these grill tiles right here into the small space around the edges of these round plates. I was able to do it on the top and not the bottom. I'm sure I'm probably missing something and you might have more luck than I did. The build took me around 6 hours without any sorting of pieces beforehand. The model does stand up pretty nicely on the landing gear and the nose section once you've built them, and I didn't feel the need to prop it up on the sand until later in the process as that made it easier to connect the underside with the wings. There is a fairly significant weak spot towards the middle of the build, so it can be awkward to move around in the early stages until the side assemblies snap it into place and strengthen it. Given the number of issues you have to think through in the instructions, unfortunately I think this would be very frustrating for an inexperienced mock builders. Thus, I caution anyone buying these instructions to prepare yourself for a slightly bumpier ride. None of the problems are insurmountable, obviously, but experience building moderately complex custom models will definitely work in your favor here. This is quite a heavy model, and with some serious wingspan, you do need to be a little bit more conscious and normal of where you're pushing this around, because if the wings or the cannons hit something, it's fairly certain that a section will break off. The grip is something like this, with the back of the ship snug against your palm and your finger and thumb against this section in the middle here. Also, due to the wingspan, I would not roll this too quickly. 
I have not experienced this personally, but I can ma easily imagine the wings separating or at least weakening if you whip the ship around too quickly. But as you can see, it is pretty swooshable. The S-foils are staying in place pretty well right now. If you find them loose, you usually need to secure this connection that I kind of showed you earlier at the back here. And all you have to do is kind of push back and use these grill tiles here or even the back of the cylinder to provide some pressure. And that should increase the friction so that they'll stay. Some notable weak points on this model are definitely these underside sections right here. As you can see, they aren't connected at the front, so they just can kind of flap around. The engines can come off uh, if you're not careful. They're connected by a single stud, but I actually don't find that happening too much. A far more common occurrence for me is having one of these sections come off like you just saw. During construction, the nose is extremely fragile, but after you lock the two halves together with those hinge pricks, it's very stable. Finally, the cannons are connected with just two studs, so if you do bump one, um, they're fairly likely to fall off or skew out of alignment. These are very easy to put back in place, and it might even save the entire model from falling off the shelf or if you catch your sleeve on one of them. The display stand has a sturdy 10 stud base and thus a pretty nice footprint for most display surfaces. Like I said earlier, the fighter is secure at a slight upward angle, and again, I found that using these two studs on these wedges was the best connection spot. And since this model is quite heavy, um, if you connect the stand too far forward or back, it can tip. So just make sure you use some trial and error to figure out where you are most comfortable with it. But again, I found that something like that tends to be closest to the center of gravity for the angle it is showing at. The ARC-170 by Thomas Jenkins is undeniably a great looking model. It's impressively stable for a model this large, and it has great features like well-integrated landing gear, working S-foils, and crew positions that easily accommodate minifigures. If you can get through the instructions, which don't get me wrong, it is doable if you've got some patience, the model is going to be a highly attractive part of your collection. Without any substitutions aside from the two mandatory ones, I was getting four stores and $226 without shipping and tax, or about $270 with shipping and tax. Again, that's using a $7 shipping average. With my substitutions, I got four stores and $144 without shipping and tax, or about $182 with shipping and tax. And buying as much as possible from Pigabrick, my Pigabrick total was $161, which includes shipping. Uh, sorry, which includes tax, but no shipping and handling fees because they met the minimums in both the bestseller and standard categories. The remaining elements I could get from two stores in $19 without shipping and tax, or about $32 with shipping and tax, for a total of $193. There may be some efficiencies you can pick up by purchasing more from Bricklink, vice new from Pigabrick, especially the more common elements that can be really cheap on Bricklink, like the Technic pins and the 1x2 plates. With models that have a lot of white, I tend to buy more new these days, just so I don't have to spend my time giving them a hydrogen peroxide bath, so an $11 difference between majority new and majority used is more than worth it to me personally. I do think it would be hard to get much lower than the used with subs price of $182 in the United States though. Instructions for the ARC-170 cost $19.99 and are available from BrickVault's web store. There will be a link to where you can buy those in the description below, and remember you can use the discount code CATS15 for 15% off if you haven't already used it. Thanks as always for watching my review of Thomas Jenkins' ARC-170. If you've built the model you have something to share that I left out, or have a question about something I didn't cover, please leave your thoughts below in the comments. Definitely let me know if you had issues with the instructions, I don't know, it's always possible it's just me, and plus, I'm just not very smart, so it's entirely possible the issues I have were easy for others to figure out. Remember to subscribe, leave the video a like or a comment, and follow me on Instagram if you haven't already. Each subscription, comment, and like helps increase the channel's visibility, and I greatly appreciate your support. This will be my last review of 2023, and it's been an amazing year. I hope you all have a nice holiday season, best wishes for 2024, and I hope to see you back next time.